Thanks, Nathan. Um, I know that was a long scripture reading. I did that on purpose. I think sometimes we, we take things out of context, and I think uh, reading a whole chapter like that is kind of what it was made to do, right? So Second Peter was written to a group to be read to others, just like today. So um, I'm kind of moving towards that direction in my mind when reading scripture. Um, this topic has a lot to do with what I want to speak on today. Um, as humans, uh, like it or not, we, we all have a world view. Um, that world view is always in progress, um, and it's very similar to building a puzzle. Um, from a very young age, uh, we are trying to figure out how we fit in the world and how the world works. Uh, and we try, and we, we try to find glimpses of the box top, you know, the, the top of the puzzle that we put aside and then we use to try to solve the puzzle. Um, the problem is, um, at least in the world, it's like we're trying to sort from hundreds of puzzles and trying to put the right one together. Um, we are given piece after piece, uh, and it's up to us to see if it fits. Um, some will look at the, the piece and decide it doesn't fit and they'll throw it away. Um, others will decide that it does fit um, and, then, and then they'll place it into, into their uh, incomplete puzzle. Um, some will accept it uh, and they'll try to force it in even though it doesn't belong. Um, some who don't know, aren't sure, they'll just set it aside until they can solve more of the puzzle and maybe get to it later. Of course, there are many who give up on their puzzle altogether. They assume they'll never find the right pieces. Um, also, there are many who think any formation of a puzzle or pieces are acceptable. Um, some let others form their puzzle for them, uh, whether they allow, you know, uh, soft guidance or just a complete overhaul. Uh, but no matter where you or others are uh, on forming your puzzle, uh, there is only one true box top. Uh, Jordan gave an excellent lesson on truth on Sunday. He said that the, the, the only source, only true source of truth is God. And he built an extremely strong case for that, and I'm not going to rehash that tonight. Uh, but just for argument's sake, let's just assume that God is an all-knowing God. Um, and if he is an all-knowing God, he would have access to that, um, that one true box top. He would know all the pieces. He would know how they all fit together. Uh, what got me thinking about this topic, um, this time of year there's lots of um, Christmas books and Christmas songs that are sung, and if you've read the Gospels at all, you know that there's some inaccuracies. And so this kind of came up to mind. Um, and we can see how easy it is to uh, incorrectly believe some very simple facts. I mean, I'm sure you've all had the same experience of reading through the gospel and going, well, that doesn't jive with this Christmas song. <laughs> um, and so, like if I asked you the question, uh, how many kings visited Jesus in the manger? I think Tyrone's head just exploded. Uh, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, that question. Uh, no kings visited Jesus in a manger. It was wise men, we don't know how many, and it wasn't in a manger, so that whole question is just silly. Also, I'm not sure if there really was a drummer boy. Um, we have that song, still haven't found that in scripture. Some believe um, that Jesus, you know, if he wasn't born miraculously, then it had to have been, uh, he would have had regular parents, right? And if it wasn't Joseph, then he would have been born out of wedlock in an adulterous relationship. Um, and then, so that's just about the birth. So then, then about the life, 
you know, was he just a man? Was he God incarnate? Was he just a good teacher? Was he a great prophet? Um, and we're learning a lot about that on Sunday mornings with, uh, with Dave. Um, you know, many have the wrong idea about who he was or is. Many debate about what he came to do. Uh, did he accomplish it? Was it a mistake? Is he going to come back later uh, to try to fix it? Um, and then, then about his death, uh, there's lots of theories about that. You have the uh, imposter theory, the swoon theory, the hallucination theory. You know, maybe the apostles didn't go to the right tomb. Um, maybe the apostles were in on it. They, they deceived us all. Maybe the whole story is made up. Uh, maybe he just died, just died, and didn't raise from the dead. And just so you know, all these things are real things that people believe. Um, there's people that are really messed up with the truth. Um, so how do we know what is true? Well, I'm going to make a small case tonight uh, about the authors of this book and their accounts. Um, I want to first consider uh, the incredible impact of Christ and his life as expressed uh, in a short sermon that's uh, called One Solitary Life. Now, you have to keep in mind that this sermon takes out all the miracles as if Jesus was just a man. Okay, it starts, uh, he was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant. He grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was a traveling preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a home. He didn't go to college. He never lived in a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his garments, the only property he had on earth. Uh, when he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today he is still the central figure of the human race. I am well within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as this one solitary life. So I think that's a very inspiring um, take on, on the situation here. If there was no resurrection, no miracles, if he wasn't who he said he was, born the way he was, lived the life we read of, I mean, how could this life be so the most influential life of all time? From the legalistic system of Judaism came the conversion of prominent Jews, including Paul. And as Morgan has said, you don't just walk up and have a Bible study with the Saul of Tarsus. Christ had to have had a major impact on their lives, and it has continued up to today. The apostles, including Paul, knew what they saw and heard. They proclaimed to not be merely believers, but eyewitnesses. They were willing to die and suffer for the truth. I mean, they would have buckled if they weren't sure. So in my final part of this case, uh, let me demonstrate how a lie falls apart for those who are perpetrating it versus how the truth stands. So I don't know if the name Chuck Colson rings a bell. He was the former aide to uh, President, President Nixon. And he went to jail uh, because of the Watergate scandal. Uh, he went on to uh, found this uh, prison fellowship. And so he turned his life around. But uh, he wrote, uh, Watergate involved a conspiracy to cover up perpetrated by the closest aides to the President of the United States. 
the most powerful men in America who were intensely loyal to their president. But one of them, John Dean, turned state's evidence, that is, testified against Nixon, as he put it, to save his own skin, and he did so only two weeks after informing the president about what was really going on. Two weeks. The real cover-up, the lie, could only be held together for two weeks, and then everybody else jumped ship in order to save themselves. Now, the fact is that all those around the president were facing embarrassment, maybe prison. Nobody's life was at stake. But what about the disciples, he wrote. Twelve powerless men, peasants really, were facing not just embarrassment or po political disgrace, but beatings, stonings, and execution. Every single one of the disciples insisted to their dying breaths that they had physically seen Jesus bodily raised from the dead. Don't you think that one of those apostles would have cracked before being beheaded or stoned, that one of them would have made a deal with the authorities? And none did. I think that's pretty powerful from a guy who was there during the Watergate scandal. Uh, I mean, the Watergate scandal fold, folded fairly easily. Um, when something is based on something that is false, the liars will eventually save their own skin. Uh, death wasn't even on the table in this case. Uh, compare this to the disciples who faced suffering and death. These guys had nothing to gain and everything to lose. And it's not crazy to accept the testimony of eyewitnesses who have nothing to gain. And it's, it's very rational to do. I mean, who makes up something with the intention of being a martyr for it? While many people die for a lie that they think is true, no sane person will die for what they know is a lie. I mean, what more could eyewitnesses do to prove to us that they are telling the truth? And there's no reason to doubt and we have every reason to believe that this book uh, is real, that it contains the truth, and we should listen and believe the things we read and know that this is the real box top. A while ago, uh, Second Peter, uh, in the first chapter was read, and just to refresh your memory, verse 16, for we do not follow, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Um, we're going to sing a couple songs and then be dismissed uh, by prayer by uh, Brant. But uh, let's, let's all stand and sing.